Hi everyone, this is Neil Reifeter, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. Well, I'd like to start off by wishing you all a very happy new year. I hope you all had a great start to 2024. Additionally, I hope you all had a Merry Christmas and you all got what you wanted from Santa. So we have here a patient who attended with a severe, very severe earwax impaction in this there right here. And they also had a, a bacterial um, ear infection in their left ear, known as swimmer's ear. Um, and in fact, it was the left ear why they attended. And I treated the left ear first when the patient did attend. But for the purpose of this video, I'm just showing you in reverse order. So they weren't even aware that this ear was blocked because their left one was um, so infected. But as you can see, this patient's got really dark, dry, crumbly wax occluding the entire ear canal, right from the entrance all the way to their eardrum. Because of the consistency of the earwax, I'm just currently using the new right ear hook. So this ear hook differs slightly towards the traditional ear hook I uh, used to previously use, the St. Bart's ear hook, in that the tip is more tapered, so it's got uh, more of a, a narrowed and sharper tip, which allows me to embed into the wax and almost chisel it. Um, I found the other um, previous ear hook I used to use a bit blunt at the tip, so I wouldn't. Sometimes I would struggle to embed it like I am here. Now, although the the ear hook isn't always necessarily bringing the wax out, it is chiseling it into little pieces, and that will uh, I I can then use the micro suction um, probe to to suction up any of these loose crumbly bits. And I'm also going to use the new ear pick. Uh, a bit later on in the procedure. So you can see here, I've just reverted to the uh, micro suction probe just to suction some of these uh, loose segments. Now, guys, um, I mentioned it in um, on my other video that I uploaded this evening on my Clear Wax YouTube channel and also uh, on uh, Facebook and Instagram and um, TikTok. Unfortunately, there's been a big spike over the last uh, a month, I think, and it's um, some other colleagues who post online have also uh, mentioned it to me. And the spike is in people who are just being really, really silly and acting immature and being ignorant, um, leaving silly, nasty comments, not only to myself, but also to each other. Um, I gave an example in the other video I uploaded today. Someone was wishing another viewer diarrhea on Christmas Day. And I just think, come on, guys, we're meant to be... I mean, you're all, um, I'm assuming that person was an adult, but they sure weren't acting like one. And it's um, very childish, idiotic uh, behaviour. And I just think a lot of people are really entitled as well, because when I'm uploading these videos, guys, it's not for entertainment. You might, some people may find it entertaining as a, a, a and that's fine, but that's not why I'm uploading it. This is an actual uh, medical healthcare procedure that I'm performing on a real patient. So when, um, uh, some people just leave some comments like, you know, you're too close or you're too far and uh, you don't know what you're doing. Um, you don't like it because I'm using this instrument or don't, you don't like it because I'm using that and why don't I do this and why don't I do that? Guys, this is not for your entertainment. This is a real patient. Um, um, there's one particular incident uh, just before Christmas. Someone had been really nasty and uh, kind of spouting off what I should and shouldn't be doing to the point where I believe there must have been a specialist. So I asked the individual, well, what do you actually do? What's your profession? Are you an ENT or an audiologist? And he said, no, he's a, a delivery driver. So I'm getting told what to do by someone who's got no experience whatsoever with ears, other than um, owning two ears uh, himself. Um, I mean, I'm not a HGV driver, and this is, I gave this example in the other earlier video. So I wouldn't go start critiquing, uh, giving critiques to, to someone in a profession that I don't know what they're doing because it's not my, I'm not trained or a professional in that, in that arena. So guys, it's a bit insulting and immature um, when I'm getting critiqued and being told what to do by people who have got no idea, got, you haven't got the foggiest of what's going on and how complex this procedure is. I mean, um, I, I mean, I have some, some videos, um, ENT, consultants um, complimenting the work I'm doing and then I'm getting a, a delivery driver who's never um, and I'm just giving that example just so it's their profession I've got nothing against delivery drivers I mean I wouldn't I don't know how to drive a van so I wouldn't start telling people how to drive, uh, drive a delivery van it's a very skillful job to do 
Um, but I'm getting uh, these individuals then telling me that I'm doing it wrong when I've got an ENT consultant surgeon telling me, you know, I'm doing it very well indeed and they were very impressed. So guys, just give it a break. Um, I mean, it's coming to the point where I may start disturbing comments again because I don't want to be exposed to that. This is an earwax removal channel and there's so much hatred out there in the world. It's, it's, it's quite sad and I think people leaving these comments, uh, they must have some sort of void in their life. Um, kind of, and I don't know how you how some of these people can you know be nasty on a day to day basis. It's you get some sort of thrill out of it. It's a horrible way to live, guys. So if you are one of those people, um, you know, stop being mean t- to myself and stop being mean to the viewers. I mean, people just want to enjoy the content. If you don't enjoy it, fine. No one's forcing you to watch it. So um, I don't want to dwell on that too much because it's a new year, but. I just thought I'll, you know, set the tone for this year and we'll see how it goes. But if it does continue, then I'm just going to disable the comments. And it's, it's a shame because I know a lot, it's only a small minority, but I don't want to wake up in the morning and, you know, get all these alerts and all these comments, that, you know, on my, on my phone. Um, it's just not right. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be like that. So, OK, let's continue with the video. So I've got the outer um, half out and then we've got this medial third you can see it's quite matted there's a few hairs there so I did ask the patient whether they were poking inside their ears um, they said no so it could also be when this patient has a, a trim of their beard or when they go to the barber some of these hairs can fly loose inside the ear I mean I'm, I, I sometimes have a few hairs in my ears after I go to the barbers. You can see there's a slight sore spot just on the right. There's a bit of a, a deared uh, wax and carrots. When I removed that, you can see it's just slightly blistered. Um, it's the right-hand side canal wall. Now, um, I was contemplating using um, some olive oil spray just to soften this, but the patient uh, wears hearing aids and they, were, they weren't wearing it in their left ear because it was infected. So I wanted to avoid it because if a patient's wearing hearing aids and you put oil in, there's always, a, I mean, we obviously we try and mop as much oil off as we can, but it just makes the ear really greasy and that can sometimes um, weaken the retention of the hearing aid. But also sometimes that, that oil, as it's draining back out of the ear, it can enter the hearing aid itself and um, affect the electronics. So I was just trying to avoid it. Um, so we can see the, the anterior aspect of the eardrum, the anterior quadrant. And just peeling this off, you can see it's almost like caramel, this section. It's quite sticky. But we're nearly there. And it's just, I mean, truth be told, we could have left that, but this patient is really still. I, mean, I felt quite comfortable removing this with a fine end, so we're just going to peel this away. So this is the attic region, or just to the side of the attic, actually. You can see the short process of the malleus. So just to the left, that spherical ball, that's known as the short process of the malleus, also known as the lateral. It's got two names, short process or lateral process. So it's just the tip of the, <coughs> the hammer bone. So we peel that way. So it's got quite a curved ear, you know, quite a prominent anterior recess. So probably with a wax scope or uh, an ENT microscope um, or head, head-borne microscopes, we wouldn't see the right section of the eardrum there. Or it would be quite difficult to, because of uh, how bendy the patient's ear canal is and how prominent that uh, anterior recess of the little crab, uh, crevice to the right is. So just peeling some excess um, it's dry skin there. It's a little hair strand. Let me see if I can peel that away. Go on the car- now you can probably see the boundary. We're on the cartilage portion here. The, the skin is a bit uh, a paler in complexion, a bit thicker, whereas the skin that lines the bony part of the ear canal, um, it's more red. And that's because the skin that lines the bony part of the ear canal is extremely thin, less than 0.1 millimeters in thickness. So all the blood uh, vessels and capillaries um, underneath are more visible, whereas on the... Um, the cartilage portion, the skin's a lot thicker, it's one millimetre in thickness, so the blood vessels are one millimetre, uh, you know, uh, sub um, the epidermis layer of skin, which is the outermost layer of skin. So you get a paler complexion. And of course, when you've got a thin layer of skin lining the bone, uh, the bone's texture makes the appearance quite glossy, whereas the cartilage, which is the outer third, it's, it gives you that more matte appearance. So this is their left ear. This is the ear they attended with. Now, the ear is actually, um, there's no occluding debris. You can see the eardrum, but 
this patient's got all this artery, which is the medical term for uh, discharge in the ear. Um, they have been prescribed some medication by their GP, but the GP um, had recommended they try and get this excess debris cleared first. So it then allows the topical antibiotics to really penetrate um, the, the epidermis lower skin underneath this. Um, sometimes when you've got a lot of discharge like this and you use topical antibiotics, it sits on the surface. So um, just, there still can be a hint of an infection underneath. So it's where possible good to peel this away now. Um, it's not always possible to do. It is quite complex. And I know a lot of audiologists, in fact, um, I uploaded uh, the video about the canal cholesterol term. I think it was my last one um, on a professional platform, LinkedIn. And a fellow audiologist was very surprised that you know I was removing all that debris. Um, and that's for the reason they wouldn't have attempted that. They would have just referred to the GP and asked the the, the, um, the patient to use the drops. And again, that just gives you an example, guys, when people sometimes, you know, cry and critique. When we've got colleagues who wouldn't do certain procedures that I'm doing and then to be critiqued by someone who's got no experience, it's just a bit, it's just a bit silly and, you know, um, it just shows a lack of uh, intellect on behalf of the person making these comments, so... So you can see the top part of the engine is very inflamed. There's a lot of um, erythema, so redness. There might be some granulation tissue, if memory serves me correct, we shall see. So I'm just kissing the surface of the eardrum here. Now, believe it or not, this made a big, big difference to the patient's hearing. Um, they, they felt they could hear significantly better. Yeah, so just some granulation tissue there posteriorly to um, the back section of the eardrum. Um, and not only were they were able to hear better once I removed everything. So at this stage, they still felt um, they could hear a bit better compared to when they came in. But um, when I cleared all this, you can see all this artery that's lining the canal wall. It really helped their hearing. So, and that's because the sound waves are better able to to travel through the ear canal to vibrate against the eardrum. When you've got discharge like this, it will of course absorb some of the sound waves so it will reduce the amplitude and intensity to the sound so it's just be gentle there's a bit of edema there's a swelling there as well and these are not procedures when i first started there's no way uh, i would attempt procedures like this so again it does take practice and experience and uh, to feel comfortable to do procedures like this but at first like the colleague that i mentioned earlier i would have probably just referred this patient uh, well i would have uh, advise a patient to either go somewhere else, an ENT surgeon, or uh, just start using the antibiotics and hopefully it will resolve the infection. Now, how did this infection occur? Now, this patient underwent ir irrigation, um, but they did it themselves. Um, so they did, did have some wax in here, they said. And they went online and they purchased some... Um, hydrogen peroxide drops so what hydrogen peroxide drops do they're, they're water-based they're alkaline in ph and the hydrogen peroxide when it enters the ear it reacts with an enzyme that's secreted by one of the glands found on the outer third the ceremonious glands um, they're modified sweat glands the proper name is um, um, alpocrine glands they're the same sweat glands found under your armpits and in a groin region and they secrete an oily sweat called ceramine um, so it's different to the sweat you found on your brow, which is more uh, water, watery and salty. Uh, this is more of an oily sweat. But this gland also secretes an enzyme called perioxidase. So when the hydrogen peroxide enters the ear, it reacts with the perioxida um, uh, perioxidase enzyme. And we get a transformation. The hydrogen peroxide turns into water and also into oxygen. And during that transition from a liquid to uh, oxygen, so during that um, change, um, you get uh, effervescence, you get a bubbling, a mechanical bubbling, and it's believed that the bubbling action uh, will help to break up um, the wax plug. Um, some of the hydrogen peroxide drops also contain urea, so urea is, a, again, it's more of a, um, a, a lipid secretion, but it's known as a, a, a keratinotic, so uh, keratin is a protein found in dead skin and urea can um, help break down keratin 
So again, it can help to break down a wax plug. Problem with hydrogen peroxide, though, uh, I, I really, uh, when a patient attends with hydrogen peroxide drops in their ears, it's always a complex task because it, more often than not, changes the consistency of the wax plug into a, a, a mushy, uh, wet mud consistency. So it's very difficult to suction and clear because it can keep blocking the suction probe. It doesn't come out in lumps, it comes out in little bits. It just makes it really, really difficult. To, to perform a procedure when a patient uses hydrogen peroxide drops excessively. Um, now, when you get water in the ear, um, and also when you use hydrogen peroxide, there's always a risk of uh, increasing the pH level of the ear. So water is more neutral, uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, drops are more alkaline, and our ears are mildly acidic. And when the ear is mildly acidic, it keeps certain bacteria uh, and fungi in the ear uh, non-pathogenic. So we've got resident native bacteria and fungi that actually reside in the ear. We call it skin flora. Um, wouldn't quite call it a symbiotic relationship because the, the ear canal doesn't really benefit um, from the presence of these bacteria and fungi, but the bacteria and fungi benefit because the ear canal provides its shelter and food. Um, but under um, these mildly acidic conditions and dry conditions, uh, many of the bacteria that are native to the ear canal, so the skin flora, and also the fungi, are non-pathogenic. They don't do any harm to the, um, to the ear canal. However, when the pH level increases, uh, the bacteria in particular uh, are what we call neutrophiles. They're, they're, they're most at their optimal uh, growth, um, activity uh, when the pH is more neutral. So by introducing water and hydrogen peroxide in the ear, you're going to increase the pH from a mildly acidic condition to more an alkaline or neutral, which then gives um, these bacteria an opportunity to flourish and really uh, exponentially grow and reproduce. And a couple of these native bacteria can then become um, pathogenic, so they can lead to an infection. But it also then allows external bacteria that may enter the ear, ear and some of this, uh, quite often uh, water contains some of these bacteria, to then, um, which wouldn't otherwise be in, in the ear. It gives them the perfect breeding ground to then also reproduce and grow and lead to an infection. Fungi are less susceptible to changes in pH, but they're more susceptible, um, would say, to whether there's humidity in the ear so, and warmth. So warmth and humidity will like the perfect breeding grounds of fungi. Uh, but a lot of the f fungi that leads to ear infections, so aspergillus, candida, they are, uh, most of our ears have these fungi. Uh, they're native to the ear, but it's just when the conditions change, it gives prominence to these fungi to then cause harm and become pathogenic. And this is why I myself personally am not a big fan of ear irrigation. I know um, a lot of people perform it um, and... I mean, in the UK up until recently, uh, GP practices and primary care, would, that was the main treatment um, given. Um, but there are a lot more contraindications. So there's a lot more of a tick list where you can't perform it. Um, also, there's more increased risk. Now, there's also risks involved in microsuction or mechanical removal of earwax. But um, the increase significantly increase, I would say, when you use water irrigation. Um so although there's a lot of specialists that perform it, um, because I feel comfortable uh, not resorting to it, then I, I, would, I, I wouldn't resort to it for that reason because I'm comfortable uh, removing uh, wax, debris. I mean, you wouldn't be able to perform irrigation in this ear anyway at this stage because that's one of the contraindications. When your ear is infected, you should keep the ear completely dry. Introducing water in this ear will only exacerbate this infection and make it worse. Um, in terms of... Uh, ENT in the UK, do, do, do they perform irrigation? I've never personally come across an ENT myself perform irrigation. Uh, there, may, there might be some ENT that do it, but generally speaking, it's not something that's performed by ENT for the reasons I've described, because you're just potentially increasing the risk of a patient developing an ear infection. Now, if you get, some studies say three to five out of 100, some, of the, some other studies is three to five out of 1,000, so there's some discrepancy there, but 
anecdotally, from what I see, um, I would say, I would probably say it's probably in that first region of five uh, out of every hundred. But again, that's anecdotal. There needs to be some more in-depth research, I think, um, looking at the the, the prevalent, prevalence of um, the side effects and infection caused by irrigation. But um, I think in part... When people have their ears irrigated in the UK, I don't think often anyway the ears been dried. So we have some guidelines called the uh, NICE guidelines there. I think it's abbreviated for short for the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. And you get um, leading figures in, in the field of, obviously in this case it would be ENT, um, and they look at all the peer-reviewed evidence. And so ear irrigation is part of the NICE guidelines. So... Ear syringing is not. So syringing and irrigation are two different things. So syringing in the UK, at least, that term um, refers to when the old-fashioned metal syringe, when a doctor or nurse would literally um, pump a, a, quite a big metal syringe into the ear, exert a lot of pressure. So that's banned in the UK. Now, I know in the US that's still used. And the reason why I know that, well, it was probably... Back in 2015, when I visited America, I went to a couple of conferences, uh, back-to-back um, um, summers, and I actually saw these metal syringes being sold at exhibition stands at these conferences, and I was really surprised. Um, <clears throat> but in the UK, it's banned. Now, irrigation is slightly different. So irrigation, if you go to the dentist and you get the dentist or the dental hygienist, they rinse your mouth out. They use an irrigation pump. And in fact, the first ear irrigation was performed using a dental irrigation pump by a nurse and then obviously it got modified into an ear irrigation machine. And that's where <coughs> water is more uh, pumped into the air, more uh, controllable um, uh, flow and pressure. You still can go gung-ho with it if you wish, but there's there's an adjustment on there, either a foot pedal or a, a, a dial, a switch, where you can regulate the pressure. And typically uh, um, with the irrigation, you want to aim the nozzle at the roof of the ear canal. And the concept is, is this water runs down uh, the ear canal up against the eardrum on its way back out. So you can imagine this vortex that it creates. It flushes out, takes with it any, any wax that's in the ear canal. Uh, so when patients have had this performed, you sh- they sh- sh- the ear should be dried afterwards. That's part of the NICE guidelines. That's why I made reference to it. So they do recommend drying the ear. So... Um, how do you dry the ear? So this you can put swabs in the ear, but sometimes they can be uncomfortable. As audiologists, we have access to what we call auto blocks, which are more spongy foam blocks. We we normally put it in the ear when we take an impression, so a cast of the ear. So we put this little foam stopper in the ear. So there's a string attached that then hangs out of the ear itself, and we make sure that auto block we call it that foam sponge. It creates a complete seal around the ear canal and then we inject some putty material to take the shape so similar to what dentists use to take dental impressions and then we allow that material to set and once it's set we can pull the, the impression out and along alongside it the auto block that foam sponge comes out of the ear and if not we've got the string to help us pull it out so um, that can absorb moisture in the ear um, a lot of ENT would recommend a, a solution of one part rubbing alcohol and one part um, white vinegar, which is acetic acid. And what the rubbing alcohol would do, it will homogenise um, with any excess water. So it will bind to water molecules and it homogenises to kind of create a, a new kind of um, substance. And because alcohol's got a lower evaporation temperature than water itself, it will dry up, it will evaporate much better. So it's why your hands get quite dry when you're using rubber, rubbing alcohol. So it will dry up the ear, but the risk of that is that it can over-dry the ear, it can absorb some moisture within the skin cells itself. Especially after irrigation, because what irrigation does, it, it you're washing away natural oils that are secreted by the ear, and these oils... Um, form a thin layer um, which coats the ear canal and this thin oil uh, coating of oil um, it prevents the skin that it's sitting on underneath um, r- losing its internal moisture so without that thin layer of oil lying in the ear canal the underlying skin the internal moisture within the skin cells 
it rises to the surface and it can evaporate. So these oils sit on that. They're called uh, natural moisturising factors. And when you irrigate the ear, you're washing away this natural film of oil. Um, and then obviously the underlying skin is exposed. And then when you're using rubbing alcohol in your ear, um, it can obviously absorb excess water through from the ear irrigation procedure but then it can also start absorbing moisture from within the skin cells which is counterproductive is when you're using alcohol alcohol mouthwash alcohol based mouthwash your mouth gets very very dry it's the same same concept um and these this natural oil that i i discussed that the water can wash away not only does it help moisturize the underlying skin but it's slightly and mildly acidic so it, it helps the ear retain that mild acidity which then prevents certain bacteria in particular becoming pathogenic um so the white vinegar the acetic acid it, i think white vinegar i think it's at 2.4 on the ph scale so it's very acidic and it just helps to reacidify the ear so that that's an option another option is uh, we sell it on our clear wax website we only ship to the uk we've got a drops called clear relief drops now this clear relief drops contains glycerol or glycerine um, and what that does, similar to alcohol, it homogenizes with water, but glycerol actually has a higher temp- uh, evaporation temperature, uh, temperature than alcohol, so it doesn't readily evaporate. But the benefits of glycerol is that it's also oily itself, so um, although it can absorb excess moisture, it can help to uh, moisturize the skin, which the rubbing alcohol can't. And this clear relief drops also contains lidocaine, so a topical anesthetic, so if there is a bit of discomfort pain in the ear can help to numb that so guys um we're not going to get every little aspect i think you know really did a good job here i'm really pleased you've got to be careful when you've got uh otitis externa when you've got the swimmer's ear the ear canal is inflamed so it's sensitive but that's the thing we want to do is cut this ear canal which is more likely to to abraze and cut when it's inflamed then you're allowing the infection to penetrate deeper into the ear canal and you know it can make it worse so you have to be really, really careful when you're removing otter ear, so ear discharge and dead skin and debris off the ear canal when it's inflamed because you can make matters worse sometimes. So I'm really pleased with that. The eardrums for Elizabeth and this patient could, yeah, there's a bit of bobs here and there, but we're not going to get rid of the last speck. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. Take care. Keep well. Speak soon. Bye.